This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You'll be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. General relativity, which explains how mass affects space-time curvature, has, as a result, led to the discovery of black holes. When a big star runs out of fuel and collides with itself due to gravity, a black hole is created. The star's core is crushed into a singularity, a region of infinite density. The event horizon, which stands for the boundary between which there is no turning back, is an area that surrounds the singularity. Light cannot escape the black hole's gravitational pull since it is contained within the event horizon. Black holes may be a rather confusing notion, as you can surely understand. But their research has produced significant advances in our comprehension of physics and gives us important insight into some of the most severe circumstances in our cosmos. In fact, it is particularly intriguing to consider that something so enigmatic may have such a significant influence on how we see reality. Black holes can range in size, while supermassive black holes, which are found at the center of galaxies, can have millions or even billions of solar masses, stellar mass black holes are typically about 10 times as large as our Sun. The existence of intermediate mass black holes, which fall between these two classifications, has also been proven by recent research. The idea of Hawking radiation is strongly related to the physics of black holes. This phenomena, which bears Stephen Hawking's name, describes the ejection of particles from a black hole as a result of quantum effects. Contrary to popular belief, this implies that black holes radiate a very slight glow and are not completely black. Black holes may even lose mass over extraordinarily long durations and eventually evaporate as a result of Hawking radiation. Scientists are frequently intrigued by the so-called information paradox, which is one feature of black holes. The fundamentals of quantum physics state that information cannot be lost. However, when something enters a black hole, it appears as though the data is lost forever. The concept that information might be contained in the black hole's event horizon, or that it could be indirectly retained in some other way, is only one of the many possibilities that have been inspired by this seeming contradiction and have generated significant discussion. To sum up, the study of black holes offers us a singular chance to investigate the underlying physics and the makeup of the cosmos. Black holes continue to be a rich source of inspiration for academics and an inexhaustible source of intrigue for all of us, despite their elusive and cryptic nature. What is the main idea of the lecture? How does the professor feel about the impact of black holes on our perception of reality?
What is the professor implying when they mention that information could be indirectly retained, in some other way in the context of the information paradox? What does the professor mean when they say that black holes are particularly intriguing? When the professor discusses the information paradox, what is the deeper meaning they are trying to convey about black holes? What does the professor intend to convey with this statement? Black holes continue to be a rich source of inspiration for academics. Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I was wondering if I could speak with you about accommodation options on campus for the upcoming semester. Of course, I'd be happy to help. Are you looking for a specific type of housing or do you have any preferences? I'm mainly interested in living in a dormitory that offers single rooms since I prefer to have my own space. I understand. We have several dormitories with single rooms available. However, these tend to fill up quickly, so it's essential that you submit your housing application as soon as possible. Thank you for the advice. Are there any additional facilities available in the dormitories, like study rooms or recreational areas? Yes. Most of our dormitories have common areas for studying and socializing, as well as laundry facilities and communal kitchens. That sounds great. I'm also curious about the meal plan options. What can you tell me about that? We offer several meal plan options to suit different budgets and dietary preferences. You can choose between a plan that includes a certain number of meals per week or an unlimited meal plan. I appreciate the information. I have one more question. How convenient is the campus transportation system, and is it easy to travel between the dormitories and academic buildings? Our campus has an efficient transportation system, including buses and shuttles that run frequently between dormitories and academic buildings. It's quite convenient and easy to navigate. That's great to know. Thanks for all the help. You're welcome. If you have any more questions or need assistance, don't hesitate to reach out. Good luck with your housing application. What is the main idea of the dialogue?
What does the student advisor imply when they say? So it's essential that you submit your housing application as soon as possible. How does the student feel about the campus transportation system, after talking with the advisor? What is the student advisor's attitude when they say, Good luck with your housing application. Which facilities are mentioned as being available in most dormitories? Now listen to the lecture. Welcome to the REM sleep lesson. Extensive research has been done on this intriguing sleep stage, and knowing how it works can help us comprehend many different facets of our lives. In today's lecture, we'll talk about what REM sleep is, how it helps us learn and remember things, and how it affects our mental health. The quick and erratic movement of the eyes, a lack of muscle tone, and a propensity for vivid dreaming are all signs of rapid eye movement, or REM sleep. As the night goes on, this stage of sleep normally begins around 90 minutes after falling asleep and repeats every 90 minutes or so, growing longer and more intense. The brain is reportedly very active during this stage, with neural activity resembling that of alertness, according to researchers. The importance of REM sleep in learning and memory consolidation is one of its main tasks. During REM sleep, the mind is like a sponge, soaking up information and experiences from the day. The neuronal connections in our brains get stronger when we practice a skill or learn new knowledge. These neuronal connections are strengthened during REM sleep, enabling the consolidation and long-term retention of recently learned information. Lack of REM sleep can impair cognition, cause memory lapses, and make it challenging to learn new information. As I already indicated, REM sleep and emotional health are intimately related. Research has shown that the brain processes emotional experiences when you are in REM sleep, which can assist in regulating mood and lessen the strength of unpleasant feelings. In essence, REM sleep serves as a natural form of therapy that helps us manage stress and maintain emotional balance. Unfortunately, sleep problems and lack of sleep can obstruct this normal function, leaving one more susceptible to mental health problems and more emotionally reactive. REM sleep is an essential part of our sleep cycle. What is the main idea of the lecture?
How does the professor feel about the importance of REM sleep? What does the professor mean when they say? The mind is like a sponge, soaking up information and experiences from the day. Why does the professor mention the brain's neural activity during REM sleep? Why does the professor discuss the relationship between REM sleep and emotional well-being? Why does the professor mention sleep disturbances and deprivation in the context of emotional well-being? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, Professor. I've been thinking about studying abroad, and I was wondering if you could give me some advice on the available opportunities. Of course, studying abroad can be a life-changing experience. There are many programs our university offers, including semester exchanges, summer programs, and internships abroad. Uh, what are you most interested in? I'd love to do a semester exchange, preferably in Europe. Great choice. We have partnerships with various universities in countries like the UK, France, Germany, and Spain. You should think about the courses you want to take and the language requirements as well. I'm fluent in Spanish, so I was considering Spain. What should I do to prepare my application? You'll need to submit your academic records, uh, a personal statement, and possibly some letters of recommendation. I would also recommend starting your research early and speaking with students who have participated in the program before. That sounds helpful. Thank you. How would studying abroad impact my graduation timeline? It shouldn't affect it too much as long as you plan accordingly and make sure to take the necessary courses while you're abroad. In some cases, it could even help you graduate earlier if you find relevant courses. I've heard that some students struggle with adjusting. What are your thoughts on that? It's true that there can be challenges, but it's also an opportunity to grow and develop a broader perspective. You'll likely find that the benefits far outweigh any initial difficulties. That's reassuring to hear. I'll definitely start looking into the programs and preparing my application. 
Thanks for your help, Professor. You're welcome. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out. I'm always here to help. What is the main idea of the dialogue? How does the student feel about studying abroad? What can be inferred from the professor's advice regarding the application process? What does the professor imply about adjustment challenges? Based on the dialogue, what can be inferred about the professor's attitude towards studying abroad? Now listen to the lecture. Let's start by defining augmented reality. With the use of AR, users can overlay computer-generated visuals, sounds, and other sensory data over their actual surroundings. This blends aspects from the actual world and the virtual realm to produce an enriched and interactive experience. AR technology has a wide range of possible uses, from entertainment to education. For instance, in the gaming sector, augmented reality, AR, has produced immersive experiences that let users interact with virtual things in their actual environment. In addition to being enjoyable, this promotes among players social connection and physical activity. AR has the ability to completely change the way we teach and learn in the realm of education. Teachers may design interesting and dynamic classes then let students visualize difficult ideas and interact with virtual objects by utilizing augmented reality in the classroom. This can help pupils learn the content more effectively and remember it longer. Let's now talk about some augmented reality advantages. First, augmented reality, AR, has the potential to produce more immersive and compelling experiences across a wide range of industries, including gaming, education, and training. AR helps us learn, understand, and retain knowledge better by fusing virtual aspects into our physical environment. Additionally, AR technology may improve accessibility for those with disabilities to help people with hearing or vision impairments navigate their environment more simply and safely. For instance, AR can be utilized 
to provide real-time visual and oral support. When it comes to AR technology, there are a few potential negatives to take into account. Among the main issues is privacy. As data from users and their surroundings is collected and stored by AR devices, there is a chance that other parties could access this data, resulting in privacy violations. Furthermore, there's a chance that we could become overly dependent on AR technologies. As we become more dependent on AR to get around in our daily lives, we can lose the ability to function without them, which could result in a deterioration in our ability to solve problems and use critical thinking. Let's briefly address the claim that augmented reality is a logical next step in human-computer interaction to close off the lecture. Human-computer interaction has developed from straightforward text-based interfaces to graphical user interfaces and, most recently, to augmented reality, which seamlessly combines digital and real-world components. This exemplifies how technology is constantly evolving to meet human needs and satisfy our desire for more immersive and engaging experiences. What is the main idea of the lecture? Why does the professor say that augmented reality represents a natural progression of human-computer interaction? Which of the following is not a potential application of augmented reality mentioned in the lecture? Sort the following statements about augmented reality based on whether they were discussed in the lecture or not. What potential drawback of augmented reality does the professor express concern about? According to the lecture, which of these is not a benefit of augmented reality?